Welcome to Inside Hawaii Real Estate. I'm Will Tanaka. And I'm Leoni Lam. And we are honored to be your hosts for today's show, Inside Hawaii Real Estate. Will is a full-time Hawaii real estate professional and a licensed attorney. And Leoni is a Hawaii real estate broker, a 20-year veteran in the industry, and a board member of the Honolulu Board of Realtors. And our combined experience has led us to the show. So what time is it? It is showtime, baby. So just in the last few days, there were a couple of real estate topics that came up in the news that we wanted to discuss together and with you. So there's been three hot topics in Hawaii real estate right now. Uh, number one, a new condo tower development in Moili'ili in town. Uh, number two, Oahu short-term rental law. And number three, perspectives on buying in Hawaii. All right, so in the new home development arena, there's a new condo development that's in the works, right? That's right. It's called Kuile Place. So over the weekend, news outlets reported out that the very, very well-known and well-respected local Kamaena developer, the Kobayashi Group, um, mm. is planning to build a brand new residential condo tower complex called Kuile Place. And it's gonna have over a thousand condo units in Mo'ili'ili. Mo'ili'ili? Where in Mo'ili'ili? It's actually going to be on Kapilani Boulevard. It's going to be on the mm. block that's in between sort of Iolani School and then Kaimiki High School on the other side. So right now there's a bunch of low rises there and it's going to be like 3.2 acres, I think, a large condo development right there. Um, they're proposing a 400 foot tower, so much higher than the existing towers that are there now. And they're looking at building 1,005 units to be exact. And 60% of those units are considered or going to be for affordable housing. And so that means that households or people that are gonna purchase that, they're gonna have to meet, meet income limits. So they're not going to be able to purchase unless they meet those limits. And then they have to live in the unit or owner occupy it, as they call it. Mm. The rest of the units, like 40% of it, they're going to be market priced. And then there's going to be a mix of one, two, and three bedroom units. No studios. Oh, well, no studios. Okay. One, two, and three bedrooms. Okay. That's interesting. And, you know, there's been a lot of talks about affordable housing in Hawaii. And when we're talking about affordable what, what does that really mean? Yeah, so for this particular project, uh, the prices are not final, but what they are saying or the developer is proposing is their prices are for a one bedroom, you're looking at about 371,800, so about 372,000 for a one bedroom. And then they said for three bedrooms, you're looking at about 813,000 or so. So these ranges are the so-called affordable and it's going to be available and affordable to people probably in the moderate to moderately high income levels. Mm, okay, so 372 for one bedroom, about 800,000 for three bedroom. And whether that's considered affordable will really depend upon the buyer situation, right? Because if you look at the median sales price for single family homes, it's 1.1 million. I remember earlier this year, I sold a one bedroom condo for about 350,000 but the condo, the building itself was built in the 1960s and also got a first time home buyer into a small, tiny two bedroom apartment for less than 300,000. But if you consider the age of the building, it built in the 1960s, um, maybe it was fair value. So 370,000 for a one bedroom in town at Kula Place, it may be considered affordable for, for some. Yeah, I, you know, so for, for $372,000 condo, what would the mortgage payments look like for something like that? Mm, okay, so for three seventy two, dollars let's break this down. 20% down, that would be uh, 75000 for a down payment. The monthly payment would be around 2200 a month with the current interest rates. But that also means that you know they need to save up some money. Right, because they're going to have to save for the down payment. And so they're looking at maybe like a $2,200 a month mortgage payment plus some maintenance fees and utilities. And when you're talking about a affordable three bedroom and the price point is around $800,000, then what would a home buyer be looking at paying? 
Yeah, then you could expect to double to about 4,500 a month. And you also have to add the monthly maintenance fee. So that could kind of take it over the 5,000 a month threshold, right? And other expenses. Got it, got it. So then why would, I mean, why wouldn't someone just continue to rent versus buying, right? Would that hmm. be cheaper for them? You know, that, that's always a, a question, especially for first time home buyers or people, um, you know, maybe living with their parents or just move back. I mean, it really depends on everyone's personal situation. I mean, take my own parents, for example. You know, after they sold their condo in Japan when I was six to bring our family to the U.S., they never rented a home again. So they've always rented for the last 40 years. And, you know, at that time, uh, maybe it was a financial situation. It afforded them flexibility, predictable monthly income. You know, we didn't have HOAs. And if something went wrong, I remember the landlord coming to our house and, you know, fixing stuff at our house. Got it, got it. So I guess in the long term, there's just something about home ownership, right? I mean, there's both tangibles yeah. and intangibles. Um, there's the building equity in the home, which essentially for most people, it builds their wealth, right? I mean, that's kind of the basis for building their wealth. I think that there's tax deductions. You could rent out part of the property, um, which is what I did with my home years ago when I first purchased. Um, we rented out a portion to help offset our mortgage. And so I guess there's like just overall sense of pride, home ownership, a sense of stability, possibly um, creating a legacy for future generations, right? And so I guess, you know, that's part of the benefits. No, absolutely, yeah. And, you know, I mean, but we're not gonna expect our kids to just wait till we, you know, move, move on. I mean, they're gonna have to purchase their own home. We might help them, you know, depending on our situation. <laughs> But anyways, you know, great points on home ownership. And, you know, we talked about affordable units for Quillet Place uh, for people also with uh, moderate incomes. So, I mean, I'm kind of curious, what are the price ranges for market price units? And so, when I say market price, I mean, you know, we're talking about condos that it's unrestricted investors, second homeowners could purchase. Well, what are the prices for those? So you're asking about the prices for the ones that are not deemed affordable, the other 40% of this particular project, right? That's right. That's so right. yeah, expected, um, their prices are not set yet, but what they threw out was for a one bedroom, it could be about 705,000. And then, you know, for the three bedrooms, it's going to be over a million. Over a million. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, I believe that the state board just endorsed Quillet Place to move forward. Yeah, that's right. I think it's going to be, um, it's still going to be a long process, it looks like. They're going to need to get building permits. They're going to need to be approved by the city council and I'm sure a myriad of other items before this project really gets going, but it's looking good. And um, basically, I think it's going to be a very good project for this area. This area hasn't seen any new development um, in, a, in quite a long time, I think. It's, it's, I think it's going to be like a revitalization in some aspects. Hopefully, it'll become a more walkable community and um, somewhere that will be desirable to be right in town, you know, so I think that's going to be a huge benefit. And, um, you know, part of it's going to be affordable and part of it's going to be market. And I, I know that more information will be coming out soon. And if all goes as planned, according to the developer, hopefully, we'll see sales begin even as early as, you know, later this year, or probably early in 2023. That's coming up. Yeah, it's coming up. So we'll stay tuned for more information. I just wanted to, you know, we just want to stay updated on that. So another really hot topic um, that we wanted to kind of cover that's been on the news, like just this past weekend, is um, the Honolulu short-term rental law. What's the latest going on with that? Okay, well, let's first talk about what is a short-term rental. So a short-term rental is when you rent a property for one night up to 30 days. So they're also known as vacation rentals and considered as an alternative to a hotel. So, you know, renting out a property for 29 days or less is considered short-term. Are you talking about like Airbnbs or like VRBOs? <laughs> exactly. Airbnbs, VRBOs, and also some short-term rental units could operate like a hotel. For example, you know, the Ritz-Carlton Waikiki, part of it is actually owned by the Ritz, the hotel itself, but part of it, another tower, it's owned by actual investors and some homeowners, but it's a specific condo unit that they own. 
and they use an outside property manager or have it managed by the hotel operation. So the property is a legal short-term rental property like, like the Ritz, for example, then you're, um, then you're allowed to rent it for you know, a few days or even a few weeks. Okay, so for you're saying for 29 days or less, that is considered short-term. That's right. Okay, and then rental is 30 days or longer, that's considered long-term. That's right, exactly. Yeah, like a six month rental, you know, a one year lease, okay. long term rentals. And the hot button issue that occurred earlier this year was that the city and county of Honolulu, our mayor, which covers the entire island of Oahu, passed an ordinance called the Bill 41, which increased the minimum short term rental period from 30 days to 90 days. So, in other words, anything less than 90 days is considered short-term and is illegal. Okay, so that was instead of the 30 days, it was gonna be extended to 90 days. To 90 days, Bill right. Okay, so yeah. yeah, I would say probably over the last five to six years, the city and county has really been cracking down on illegal Airbnbs and other short-term rentals, right? With fines and stuff like that. Oh yeah, right. And I believe the homeowners in the community in Kailua really took the lead probably about seven or eight years ago when Airbnb you know, started popping out, popping up on Oahu, and there, there was an abundance of Airbnbs. And you know, whether it's like they were operating like a hotel where people could just Airbnb for a few days or a bed and breakfast, they were very prevalent. And the community got together and really started to um, you know, take notice and call for action from the city. Got it. So when you're, I notice now when you go onto an Airbnb or VRBO website and you do an online search for Hawaii or Honolulu specifically or Oahu rather, you'll see that probably 90% would you say are concentrated in Waikiki? Like that's where you're going to find them at this point. Yeah, the overwhelming majority. I mean, 90%, I think that's pretty accurate. So you could just go on the VRBO or, or um, Airbnb. And if it's outside of the Waikiki area, then it's a short-term rental ad. It's going to say minimum 30 days. Got it. And so, you know, outside of Waikiki, where it's resort zone, which essentially means hotel zone, basically, right? Mm -hmm. um, can you do Airbnb or do they have Airbnbs outside of Waikiki? Yeah, so it's, it's a very limited circumstance. So you got to be either in a resort zone or nearby where that's particular building is um, as an exception. And then the other exception is that back in, way back in the 90s when they started limiting you know, um, short-term rentals to less than 30 days, um, there were homeowners who were doing Airbnbs 30 years before Airbnbs existed and they had an opportunity to be grandfathered in. So they applied for what's called a non-conforming use certificate, NUCs. And so homes with those NUCs could still Airbnb it and do short-term rentals. But on Oahu, there's less than probably 800 homes and condos in the, in the entire island. So it's very few. Yeah, very limited, yeah. So you were limited, mentioning yeah. earlier earlier about Bill 41, the short-term, and that how it was gonna go from 30 to 90. And right. so that was <clears throat> moving forward with that. But then just over the weekend, um, it was announced that this law, the 90 days, it was gonna go into effect like on Sunday this week, right? but then a judge um, put a stop to it. And so it's, it's still back to 30 days again. Okay, that's right. So the mayor passed the 90 day short-term rental law back in April of this year. It was supposed to start this Sunday, October 23rd, but a federal judge recently granted a preliminary injunction ordering the city and county of Honolulu to not increase the short-term rental period from 30 to 90 days. Okay, so right now then we're back at 30. Exactly, back at 90. I am sorry, back at 30, yes. We're back at 30. Back <laughs> okay. at 30. <laughs> and um, can you explain to me, the layman, like what is a preliminary injunction? <laughs> okay, so preliminary injunction is a fancy word for a temporary order. So it's not a final decision by the court. It's just preliminary. It's just temporary. So when the complaint, the lawsuit was brought up back in, you know, this past summer with the information what, that the judge had at, to this point, you know, he decided that there's some constitutional legal issues that could harm the homeowners who 
who are who would no longer be able to rent it out between 30 to 89 days. So as of right now, the short-term rental period is still anything less than 30 days. And we'll just have to kind of wait and see what happens next. Do you think there's going to be more to come? Or do you think that it's going to remain at 30? Like, what do you think? Ooh, so, okay. So, you know, with this issue, so the people who actually filed the lawsuit, these are very limited. So it's not that it completely, it's not like everyone's suing the city and county. It's these specific people who are renting it for a minimum 30 days at a time. So they want, you know, what happened back in the 80s where they just want a special exception to continue to do that. And then for anyone new, then the 90 day rental, short-term rental law would apply. So it's a very specific group of people who actually filed that lawsuit. I get it. I get it. So what does it mean for us? Like, why is it such a hot topic, do you think? Well, you know, it's a hot topic because, you know, just in the last few months, uh, you know, I had a friend who had a temporary work assignment for just one month and just staying in a hotel with the resort fees and parking fees, it would have been cost prohibitive for him to get a hotel. I, just, I know traveling nurses need a place to stay for shorter periods of time. And oftentimes it could be a couple months, uh, three months, and it would be oftentimes less than 30 days. And I heard of a, a someone else, a new grandparents, right, who's here to take care of their new grandchild. grandchild. Uh, the place, you know, their kid's place is too small, so they need to stay for a couple of months. But again, hotels are too expensive. So I think um, there is a need for these uh, short-term rentals that are shorter than 90 days, but longer than the 30 days. I get it. That's an interesting perspective. And, yeah. you know, I guess it was because some of the homeowners or investors of these short-term rentals that they were running, I guess they were operating it in, in not a legal way, or maybe they're abusing the system and yeah. running, you know, illegal Airbnb type of operations, right? And then I guess maybe with Hawaii not having enough homes, having a housing shortage and all that, the investors were profiting and they weren't really helping with the housing shortage situation because it was attractive for them to invest in these properties where they were able to do these Airbnbs and everything, especially in residential areas, right? Exactly. And I mean, like you mentioned, it, it's going to drive up their prices if you're able to do Airbnbs and you know, I mean, who wants to have neighbors who are, you know, transients who's changing, you know, every few days, right? Then might as well just uh, stay in Waikiki, for example. So, I mean, you want a certain feel and stability to the neighborhood. But again, you know, you also want to, there's some level of protectionism for the prices for the, for the local families. So there's always going to be a balancing factor. And uh, hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll reach a resolution probably sometime next year on that. Yeah, well, I like how you highlighted the two sides to it, right? Because there's the short-term housing need for, you know, actual people that need to have like a shorter than 30 day. And so I understand that side of it. And then I also understand the other side of it. So it right. makes sense. Yeah. So let's segue on to the third topic that we wanted to talk about, which was purchasing real estate in Hawaii, right? If I wanted to purchase a home or investment in Hawaii, what is the home buying process like? Well, that's a loaded question, Leonie. I mean, we both personally been through the home buying process throughout the years. And of course, we help, you know, people buy and sell. And, um, you know, that's one thing good to know is that Hawaii is a very buyer friendly state. What do you mean by buyer friendly? <laughs> what does that so, mean? <laughs> buyer friendly. Okay. So typically when you enter into a contract, you're locked in, right? You lease a car. You're locked in for three years with no way out unless you pay off the entire lease, right? And when right. you enter, so when you enter into a Hawaii real estate contract, the buyer puts in their earnest money deposit. But as the buyer, you should know that you're not as locked in. So maybe when I say buyer friendly, maybe it's more like consumer protection. Maybe that's a better word, consumer protection. Well, right, because you're saying the buyer has rights and the opportunity to really understand everything about what they're purchasing being their home. And then they can get all of that before they even complete the purchase, even though they're purchasing under a contract. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's right. So it's it's like buying an Apple phone, right? I think you still have like a 14-day 
a warranty or money back and you, you could still get a refund and you know make sure that it's the right home for you so you want to make sure that the home you're buying i mean it's going to be um you know infinitely more expensive so you want to make sure that you, before you get really locked in that you do your due diligence and as long as you cancel within the contract deadlines the buyer can cancel the contract and get your deposit back so for someone that wants to purchase real estate in in Hawaii, I mean, besides the purchase price, which which is going to be stated and negotiated or and all of that, what would the buyer's typical cost look like? I mean, how long does the entire process take? Okay, so let's just uh, for ease of reference, million dollar property. You, you know, you're buying a property for a million dollars. So buyer's cost will be typically one percent to two percent. So that includes the lender's fees, appraisal fees, uh, the inspections, escrow and title fees. And, you know, some people ask, well, how about the realtor's commission? So in Hawaii and just in generally, the, the seller pays uh, both the seller's commission, uh, seller's agent's commission and the buyer's realtor's commission. So the buyer's not responsible for paying the realtor's commissions. And you know, so you're house hunting, going to open houses, you're ready to submit an offer, and then there could be some negotiation back and forth, and you get a fully executed contract. I mean, that's, you know, that's an exciting time if uh, when an offer gets accepted. Yeah, so that's when the buyer's due diligence and, and inspection period begins? That's right. Okay, and so escrow is open, the buyer puts in their initial earnest money deposit because they're saying, hey, I'm going to buy this house. So they put down a deposit. And then one of the first things that the buyer would want to do is to get a general home inspection. <clears throat> There's also many other inspections that we would recommend depending yeah. on the age and the price point and the type of home it is, condo versus single family home, right? Absolutely. So general home inspection, it's even the contract, it's highly or strongly recommended that all buyers get a general home inspector. And on top of that, I mean, depends on how, what the home inspection report says, but there's also sewer sc scoping. Um, that's when you get like a plumbing company to get a little camera and then scope the entire length from the house all the way to the public sewer line. And you know, even with older homes, you just want to make sure that there's no break, there's no, um, it, there's no damages, you know, because some of these homes, they were built in the 50s and 60s, and may, maybe these pipes were not made to last that long. You also have roof inspectors, solar PV panel inspectors, AC, electrical, structural engineers uh, for ocean properties. Uh, there's soils engineers, pool inspections. I mean, it's kind of unlimited. Well, I shouldn't say unlimited, but there's a lot. So that's a lot of inspections, right? And so the cost of these due diligence, you know, sort of inspections, the buyer would be responsible for paying for all of these, right? So that's right. If and also if I was a buyer and I wanted like all of it, because I want to make sure that this house is gonna yeah. last or everything is good with it, like how long would all of that take? Oh, great question. Okay, so generally the inspection period and we call it the J1 inspection period, is between about 10 to 15 days, more common 10 to 12 days. So this means that the buyer for any reason could cancel the contract during this 10 to 15 day period and get their money back. And you know, once you get the inspection report, um, you, know, you could try to get more inspection like a sewer scope, for example, and you, the realtor, your, the buyer's realtor will go over three options with you. So number one, you could request for repairs and credits from the seller. Number two, you could accept the property as is. So there, it's damaged, there's some repairs, the roof is old, but you could accept it as is. Or number three, you could cancel that escrow and get your money back. And okay. yeah. Yeah, so in addition to the inspections and like being able to cancel during that period, there are two other ways, right, to cancel the contract. Is it the um, review of title report and That's then right. also the review of seller's real property disclosure statement? Oh, yeah, those are two important stuff. So those are three ways, the inspection, review of title report, seller's disclosure statement. And generally, 
those usually about seven to 10 days. That's the contingency deadline from the receipt of those documents. So you want to make sure that the escrow company is that the parties agree to on top of it and delivers that title report to you as soon as it's ready. And seller's disclosure, it's a really important document that must be thoroughly reviewed. And usually you have about seven to 10 days after you receive it. And you could always ask the seller, you know, more specific questions, like if it says, hey, water leak and then fixed, what does that really mean? Oh, okay, Th there was a leak during the 40 nights of rain and they fixed it by putting a French drain. Okay, now the buyer's a little bit more comfortable with proceeding. So yeah, th there's a lot that goes into um, just the beginning portion of uh, buying a home in Hawaii. Yeah, so <clears throat> now what does the time frame look like? So I mean, we kind of talked about like, if you want to purchase a property and yeah. then all these, you know, obvious the due diligence or all these inspections that you want to have done on the property so you can make sure about mm -hmm. what you're buying. Well, what does the time frame look like? So the time frame is usually from beginning to end once escrow opens, typically 45 days, about 45 days from beginning to end. And that's 45 days if you're financing, right? If you're financing, if it's cash, 30 days typical. Um, I've seen people close it as soon as a couple of weeks up to 30 days. So it does depend on that on the situation. Oh, got it, got it. Understand. Wow, that's a lot to cover. <laughs> that was a lot of hot topics today. So thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to Inside Hawaii Real Estate. And we will see you next time. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.